In the tunnel. In the tunnel. In the tunnel. You're listening to In the Tunnel. Welcome to In the Tunnel, episode number 109. Yeah, so uh, today we're going to take a look at some of the playoff stuff that's been going on. Uh, so I think we're just going to kick it off by starting directly with the NBA. Yeah, I think that's probably the best place to start. Um, partially because of the lunacy that kind of is surrounding the one series that's left. Uh, being the Heat and the Celtics, um, which uh, I I look, I haven't gambled long enough to understand how frequent this is. Um, but the betting landscape versus the reality of what basketball is is just completely night and day in this. Um, so we have the Miami Heat who have. They're the eight seed. They had to go through the play-in, which is its own stupid thing to survive and make it into the playoffs. Yep. Uh, took down the number one seed Bucks, then took down the Knicks, and now their uh, reward is to play the Celtics, who were a fifty-seven win team over the season. But once they've gotten to the playoffs, they—I mean, I think they gave up two games. In a series to the Hawks, which the Hawks were not a great team. Correct. Um, They gave up, I think, yeah, they gave up three games to the Sixers because they needed to come back from down 3-2 to win that series. Um, And at this point, they were down 3-0 to the Heat and now are down 3-2. But the interesting part of this is the NBA is unique in that a 3 nothing reverse sweep, or I guess a 4-win reverse sweep, has never happened before. There have been instances where teams have gotten back into it to Game 7, but they've but lost. never won. Um, yeah. Correct. Um and to be in the hole when you're uh, the favorite and you have home court advantage also doesn't bode well because um, I guess you want that ultimate home court advantage in a potential game seven. But I think if there's anything that can be learned is that the Miami Heat are just always the same. They have the same play style. Yep. And... It's kind of like the New England Patriots with Tom Brady. Is like they played the exact same way for 20 years, and it just worked. And the Miami Heat, regardless of who plays for them, regardless of their record, if they make the playoffs, I think this is a learning lesson for any true basketball fan that you can't think that they're going to get swept or – that any series is going to be easy. It's I mean, also, like, yeah, like, again, the Celtics have been the favorite basically the whole time, even when they were down 3-0 to win games. Yeah. And let, let me also just take a second to say, on the West Coast or Western Conference side, that the Nuggets uh, came out of their uh, conference, beat the Lakers, uh, I think that was a clean sweep, yep. and I don't know. I think that one was a little bit less surprising just because, yeah, the Lakers are kind of finding their stride a little bit better after the trade deadline, but I don't think that I looked at them as a true threat to anybody. Like, I, I thought it was a magical run for their fan base in their eyes, but... 
it realistically there was only a certain amount of time before that was going to fail. There yeah. were just stronger teams with just as much star power. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not saying it was going to be Phoenix that took them out. I, I thought it was it could have been the Nuggets. I think the Clippers potentially could have taken them out if they matched up with them. Um, I just think that there were a number of teams that that were in a position to. Fair. Um, I don't know, but I will say you know I I hate LeBron's uh, antics <laughs> drastically, but I will say. <laughs> that what the Lakers did this year was kind of the right thing to do and that they they just got rid of Westbrook and they traded for bench depth because they didn't really have any. And bench depth has proven in the playoffs this year to be the ultimate X factor. Um, I would agree. And the Nuggets have it um, for sure. But getting back to the Eastern Conference, um... I don't know. Like, if the Celtics were down 3 nothing in the series, the foregone conclusion should be the Heat are going to win the series if not if not how, but when. Um, because at this point, they ran through three teams. You know, I, I think they took out the Bucks in five games. So, like... Yeah. I don't think there's any intimidation factor at this point. Mm. Um, but yeah, you want to uh, go into the next graphic here? Yeah. So, you know, I checked DraftKings today because uh, unfortunately I, I didn't think to screenshot it in the moment. But like I said, the big thing about this is the amount of people and the amount of data that I guess suggests that the Celtics are going to be the first team to reverse sweep. Yeah. And it doesn't make any sense to me because throughout this whole postseason, if there's one thing that's been true, is that the Celtics have been very inconsistent, especially with their star power. Mm-hmm, definitely. Whether it's been Jason Tatum, like, has two or three quarter spurts of just not shooting. If it's Jalen Brown averaging uh, or not averaging, but contributing like 12 to 13 points less than his average. Yeah. Um, they've made it really hard on themselves to win. Uh, and I mean, it's no different than the rest of the NBA. When I say teams either win in via blowout or they lose via blowout. But I guess right now we're in a situation where, like I said, I should have gotten the odds earlier. But the belief was after game five, when the Celtics were down three to one still, that they were the betting favorite to win the series. Which would have been the first, which will or would be the first team to reverse sweep in NBA. Right. And it's like, that's absolutely crazy, and part of me thinks like anybody in their right mind should have put money on the Heat to win the series at that point. Hmm. Because like the data says that's a loss you can live with if it happened. Mm-hmm. Because there's been, I think it's 150 times. Yeah, fair. Yeah, you know, that team's gone up three nothing because they used to do five game series in the uh, yeah 90s. So. To go from up 3-0 to lose 4-3, I think you can put a fair amount of confidence in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Celtics were, what my, what does the graphic say, over minus 500 to win the series? Yeah, minus 500 for the series. Started. Yep. And at this point, they're plus 1, 125, what was it, to, to win the series. And yet... If you were to pick a champion of the three teams that are alive, the team that's up three to two and at one point was up three to nothing in their series is a 300 point underdog to the Celtics. Hey, like, what the are you Nugget, do? Yes, are the favorite. I'm not really sure why, because I don't know. Like, the Nuggets weren't the favorite the past two years, despite having good records and having basically the same team. 
but um, for this year, I, I don't understand how he can have the Celtics boosted this much. I don't understand how the Heat have been pretty dominant on their home floor this whole postseason and now going into tonight the Celtics are three-point favorites in Miami like it, there's a fair amount of I don't understand involved in this and um I, I'm not really sure where to go with it yeah uh yeah and and this is just like uh, unsuccessful comebacks, right? So, like, 3-0 deficits in pretty late rounds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, there's been no 0-3 comeback so far. All right. The instances where there has been uh, a relative comeback have been pushed to Game 7. Most of the time, it's been the lower seed that has come back but they're the visiting team in Game 7, yeah. and that's where they've lost. Mm -hmm. um, the I guess one of the advantages for the Celtics in this respect is they're the favorite, and should they come back, Game 7, unlike these other instances, is not a visiting game for them. Mm -hmm. But like, can you really trust that? Yeah, they'll be a home team on a game seven. So that's uh, mm -hmm. one thing going for them if they do make it to that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the other playoffs, let's look at the NHL. So the NHL is in a similar state, right? We have one team that's known, one team that's not, but we all are pretty sure. Uh, what do you think? How do you think the playoffs have come as a fan outside of any playoff team? I think it's very interesting because, look, you know, with me being a Penguins fan, we were p battling the Islanders and the Panthers for that last spot that the Panthers ended up occupying. Yes. And you know, I was very adamant about if it was the Penguins in that last spot, Boston would have dismantled them in a sweep. Yes. Because they I were not I, playing well. I would They agree. never found the recipe. But if there's – and I think, that, like, the Panthers were the only team in the NHL that had a winning record against Boston this year. It was, like, even or winning, yeah. Once you got to the playoffs, you had every right to throw that out. Yeah. Because, like, the Boston had been on such a record pace that in the regular season they could afford to lose. Mm -hmm. um, but – the weird thing is, it wasn't that it was easy for the Panthers, but it was that the Panthers against Boston always kind of looked like they were in control. Yeah. Um, and so we know the science backs it up, and I've said it a number of times. Hockey compared to a sport like basketball is way more contingent on luck versus skill. Whereas basketball is the sport that's most contingent on skill. Skill gets you everywhere. In hockey, it really is about a puck you know, bouncing. Good, yeah, bounces and you know miscues. I mean, it's not so to say that skill why... doesn't get you places. Oh no, absolutely. But because of how playoff hockey works, it's mm -hmm. a completely different game. Yeah, and that game is centered on defense taking over and it basically comes down to in a lot of series who makes the mistake and not who makes the um the highlight play now there have been instances with the florida panthers where the highlight play has won them a game yeah. like it did against uh carolina with kachuk scoring with five seconds left yeah but i i think it's become less surprising as it's gone on that the Panthers were kind of just settling in. Plus, don't forget, they were supposed to be a good team this year. They just kind of... They the the big trade they the made with Huberto yeah. kind of, like, fucked up the chemistry. Yeah. Um, I think it's more surprising that... And actually, now that I think about it, kind of isn't. Teams 
with low offensive firepower are you'd think are in the best shape to win cups, but the recipe over the like past five to seven years, maybe longer has kind of shown that you're like a, a lock to get to the second round. But after that, you're kind of like mm -hmm. risking it. So he's like, I don't know. I, I mean, I, you could just be unlucky and become the, Pan uh, the Maple Leaves and Lightning series that this year's first round was. Yeah, that's true. And look, I, the Panthers had the advantage of they played against teams with their back against the wall mm -hmm. for reasons that had nothing to do with the Panthers. The Toronto Maple Leafs will always have the back against the wall of they have all this offense, they have all these stars, and they haven't gotten far. So they will always have that pressure of what can you do because it's a failure unless you go far. The Boston Bruins had the pressure of it's the best season in NHL history, and if they don't win the cup, then it's considered a failure. So none of these things are. I mean, I wouldn't say that if they didn't win the cup, it's a failure. I'm saying that. They well, should have made it to the ECF. Chance. It was their last realistic chance at the at yeah. the cup because of Bergeron, yeah. because of Marshawn. But I definitely do course, think getting old. out of the first round, uh, not getting out of the first round, is a failure. But I don't think oh, yeah, that absolutely. winning the cup, not winning the cup, is a failure. If they got to the ECF, I would have been like, yeah, they they made a pretty good season. Because yes, at but... some point, like, I, I'm thinking by the Eastern Conference Finals, like, the record goes out the window. It's just who can play a better seven. It's true. But I, I think, let me backtrack a little bit and say that the expectation was still a pretty deep role. Yeah, um, I, I will say puck, that puck too. luck is always going to exist. But, and you had a good point with that. But I think at the same time, like, the, the puck luck should not have, puck luck should not and did not, uh, impact that series to make the Panthers win, right, like like right. the full series. And, right, and I think what's m most surprising is kind of the Panthers are getting stronger as it goes on. Yeah, because they had Boston in seven, yep. but I think the Maple Leafs they had in what five five. And then they had the Hurricanes in four. Yeah. Like, for the last seed, because we only have in this current format, or I guess the 16 team format, the National Predators to look at as the other 16, quote, 16 seed, mm -hmm. you know, bottom seed to go this far. Yeah. And they basically were just kings of game seven mm -hmm. every round. Oh, um, yeah, definitely. So this is a completely different look, and it's one that I think is hard to stop. The only thing is, like, look, now let, let's flip to the, the Hurricanes, though. Mm -hmm. um, and and we'll, get, ECF. Actually, we'll get to them in a second, but um, let, let's touch on the West. So, I mean, this series that's currently going on was, mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, supposed to be a sweep. Yeah, I, I but Dallas always strikes me as a team that they they always put together a roster that's good enough to make the second round. Mm -hmm. They've done a good job of showing their investment while not necessarily risking the farm to be good because they mm -hmm. have solid up and coming talent that has you know like Robertson and Hints. Yeah, um, definitely. But at the same time. Vegas just kind of like quietly does their thing. Uh, and with we were... three goalies that like, yeah, are like you. You wouldn't recognize them from three three years ago in the league, basically. Yeah, we talked last night in our pre-show about they acquired Jonathan Quick and basically have not played him at all. I don't think they should. have instead leaned on guys who, um, uh, have been. Like, okay, we found out that um, Aiden Hill, I think, uh, was pretty much proven, but for very bad teams. Um, 
Yeah, he did. So he had a really good stint on those Sharks. Yeah, and had four pretty much low backup stats seasons on the Coyotes. Yeah. Which we had a good laugh about, you know, if there were any two teams that you could basically cross off and not give a shit about for the past five years, it was basically anywhere that Aiden Hall or Hill was playing was those two teams. Um, but they're... The Western Conference is interesting because it's the exact 180 of the style that's going on in the East. Yeah, you definitely. have Vegas pouring in goals against Dallas, whereas it was Florida in a dogfight against Carolina. Um, yeah. I mean, again, so, on the East, right, in order to get your, like offensive powerhouses it was literally the first round matchup between the lightning and the maple leaf no other team aside from you can argue the bruins were as offensively talented or relied on their offense as much and even then the bruins relied on their goaltending a good deal um so i do i do think once well, obviously, right? One of those two teams between the Lightning and the Maple Leafs had to lose the first round. And right, so... Which I think that in itself was advantageous for whoever played in the second round. Correct. So I do think that just the teams that got into the playoffs, you were already gearing to see such different styles of play between the West and the East. Yeah. And I think... To an extent, every year it's kind of different west than the east. Um, but I mean, like, if you look at the west, Mark right? If you look at the west, right? You had Vegas, you had Edmonton, uh, you even had the Colorado, who's supposed to be pretty offensively talented. You have Dallas, who's showing up with goals. W- what team isn't trying to score? Maybe, maybe the Jets, but like, they were what seven or eight. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, the Jets being in the playoffs in itself was kind of an afterthought. Yeah, exactly. Like, you had four or five teams, basically just offensive powerhouses. You couldn't lose all of them in the first round. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I do think that just the teams that made it and their, you know, who they were playing against really defined the styles that you were going to see in each side being so drastically different. So let, let's go through the three teams that are left between Florida, Vegas, and Dallas. I, and I think you're saying it's a foregone conclusion that it's going to be Vegas versus. I really think Vegas should have closed it out in four. Uh, and I still do think they should win the series. Which, for a brief time, we did have an opportunity to say that in both the NBA and NHL, the conference finals were both sweeps. But then Miami Heat lost one, and then Vegas. Vegas lost one. Yep. But like there was a real chance there because everybody was up three nothing. Yeah. Which was absolutely crazy. Absolutely that, ridiculous. That in itself, like I I know that we say that there's not a lot of parity at that point in the playoffs, but that's kind of parity in itself just yeah. to come across that outcome more than once. Um. But yep. between, it, it, let's go with your your hunch that it's going to be Vegas. So what are the thoughts for the actual final? I, okay, so if, I, let's not even think it's going to be Vegas, right? I don't care which team from the West wins. I would pick Florida. That's kind of where I'm at, too. Uh, and, and I'm actually surprised to hear you say that. I would have thought that you kind of would have maybe leaned a little bit more towards a balance or maybe Vegas, but I I mean, I think so. My opinion on Vegas right now is the fact that they have three, I mean, their goaltenders are okay, but there's not really one giving like a amazing showing is a fluke in any other playoff year. Right. And as you said last night um, in our meeting, Decent goaltending really historically doesn't get you very far. 
exactly um, in the playoffs. And what will be interesting to find out is how Florida is going to play because of the style in the West. Because mm-hmm. they had the it, the benefit of in the East, they basically played with the exception of Toronto, they played two of the three teams that were most defensively game planning. Yeah, Um, but at the same time, right, like Toronto, they faced a lot of shots. I really do think Boston also some games, they faced a lot of shots. Like, I I think that they can handle, like, I think the defense can handle it. Right. You know, I think that they can handle it. I think it's just going to be an adjustment because yes, Toronto Mm -hmm. does it, but like, like I said, but also the playoffs are a different animal based on defense. And at one, at what point, if you walk into that highly scoring threat that is Vegas right now, do you have to throw out defense and are you capable of winning while throwing out defense? (laughs) But also at the same time, like, I don't think, regardless of who wins the West, I don't think the game plan that Florida takes is drastically different. So I really do think they could basically be planning on, like, starting to figure out how they want to play at least the opener of the Stanley Cup Finals, regardless of the team. Think, do you think that there's any disadvantage to the fact that I know that it's only a handful of days, but the fact that Florida finished up their series so early, and then the fact that Dallas stayed alive and basically bought themselves an extra two or three days, that that time off means anything? No, I think, like, I understand that people think playoff, like, you know, days off are a problem, but I really do think that there are ways to use that time effectively. Especially, like, you know your opponent is one of two teams. Get the similarities of those teams and start prepping it. Like, you you have extra time. That doesn't mean people are off the ice. That doesn't mean you stop looking at things. It, you use the time where you know and can prepare because the other two teams can't. Mm-hmm. Effectively. Use the time effectively. Like, that, that is the problem, right? And... I really hope they do because they have that time. Basically, getting a sweep gives them extra time. It should be like an incentive. Makes sense. The only thing that I have on that is I think that they're with sports now because as fans, we see it as anytime there's an off day, there is a reason to believe that these athletes have their head in film or whatever it may be but a that's just not how athletes are anymore no like the uh and b collective bargaining agreements also kind of have given more balance to uh life as well as the work in the right. sense but the i'm sport. not saying like you know go for like a full-on practice right but you know take a morning skate yeah. Spend spend maybe like two hours looking at like film or something. Yeah. It, I think it all depends on what they're allowed to do. Yeah. Because I think that there's, you know, much like the NFL, where you were in a scenario where in the NFL, regardless of what you do Sunday, regardless of if you shit the bed or not, you basically are guaranteed to not have to practice Monday because of. The collective bargaining agreement correct and what i'm interested in knowing is you know say there isn't a big turnaround time Mm -hmm. or say you have a two-day turnaround time of that two-day turnaround what actually is going on because i think there's only so many adjustments that a non-coaching staff member can make in that time period i agree and i think you know uh Florida has the benefit of game planning that now, but they may not have the benefit of adapting as needed later. Yeah. I mean, you could also make the argument that people will have to get their legs back under them because they wouldn't have been practicing as intensely or, or whatnot, or didn't have game intensity around them. So yeah, that, 
that makes sense. But I'm just hoping that they use their time to do what they can do in order to prepare. Because at the end of the day, all these players do want to win. So they're, they should be doing what they are allowed to at least in order to prepare for winning. In theory, yes. But like, look, we live in an era where we don't know any professional athlete that smokes cigarettes. But I guarantee you they're there. Yeah. Um, like, we don't know who's passionate about their craft and who isn't. And I was listening the other day to uh, a podcast where they were saying, you know, in basketball, any guy who's seven foot grew up telling, being told by everybody around them that they should play basketball because of their height. And, yeah. you know, there may be somebody who's just really good at skating that doesn't actually give a shit about hockey. Yeah. And, you know, you, so there's a number of different factors and maybe I'm dying on a hill that, or maybe even caring about something that is not really the point here, but I think that there's just so many different factors that go into it in preparedness that I don't know. I think that coaching staff adjustments at the end of the day are always going to be the biggest thing because coaches who yeah. fail to adapt. But also, are like, always the these scapegoat. rest days are a haven, too, because, like, again, if there's no game day pressure, they're guaranteed Stanley Cup. So they can, like, take take some time to not, you know, be at that intensity and have a a realistic outlook at to what your next series will be like just yeah i guess it's just for me it's a long-winded way of saying that once your body and your mind are used to the intensity the longer that you go without it because you can only replicate it so much in non-contact uh mm -hmm. you know kind of practices that once that intensity picks back up again if you're not ready for it it can hit you hard yeah but that's all you there's no, like we can sit here debating that all day, but you're not going to know how it's going to affect them until it happens. True. I just think that there's something to the team that wins a game seven and has a three day turnaround to the I mean, next series is I, probably I, the better bet for game one of the next I series. I don't know because like it's also it depends on how tough that game seven is. It depends on a lot of factors, right? Like you. Well, they can just hockey, be too tired. Think, like, they could just not true. have recovered enough, right? Like, there is so many other factors. True, but in hockey, we also know that Game 7 is the ultimate defensive grind. Yeah. Like, it's a different level. Yeah, of, no, I agree. And, but, yeah. yeah. Anyway. All right. Let's... So, yeah, where do we go from here for Carolina? Because they became a feel-good story, and I want to say... 2018 2019 or whatever the year the storm surge was uh the celebration it was either 18 19 or 20 i think i want to say it's 18, it was 19. 19 okay so let's occupy this conversation under that assumption they have gone through a defensive first style for those these past few years and rightfully so because i think at the time their core was like uh slavin and some of these other young guys that were mainly defensemen yep and then they added uh svechnikov and some other pieces later on but correct as they added offense they didn't really change the game style and the one glaring thing that they really have been passionate about is they'll upgrade anywhere except for between the pipes because yeah. they they said do with James Reimer and then they said do with Freddie Anderson and look Freddie Anderson at a time because of where he was in Toronto was deemed to be a good goaltender because the offense around him basically now, put him in a position to get wins but i mean also i like we we spend so much time talking right like decent goaltending doesn't win you a cup but i will also put it on the other side and say like star goaltending also doesn't win you a cup do yeah 
Right. It's a marginal difference. Now, that being said, in James Reimer and Freddie Anderson, you do have enough evidence from prior playoff series to understand that the regular season's a different animal for them. Yeah. And it's not it's not Marc Andre Fleury bad where it's like, you know, 20% difference, but it's it's enough of a difference to lose some games where it's yeah. basically like these guys are top 15 goaltenders in the regular season. Well, not James Reimer. Let, let me make something very clear. Definitely not James Reimer. Because <laughs> any goaltender that flopped in Detroit should not be playing in the NHL uh, past that. And yet James Reimer did. Um, and But Frederick Anderson was a very respectable goaltender. But one of his reasons why he's not still in Toronto is because in the There's playoffs, a multitude a of reasons so. why he's not still right. in Toronto. Well, money, money too, but yeah, like, um, yeah, like Frederick Anderson has collapsed just as many series as any other goaltender that was supposed to win the big ones, uh, for a, a highly prolific team. But, um, uh, I think we're at a point now where we have to say, you got to upgrade somewhere if you're the Hurricanes or you have to tear it down because yeah. regular season doesn't mean anything anymore. I mm-hmm. understand North Carolina is a smaller market for hockey and that having playoff team Okay, I will say is good in itself, the... and good for the game. Good. I will say that whatever they're doing Sorry, there was a bunch of noise in my background. <laughs> but I will say, whatever they're doing is drawing fans, though. Well, they're on NC State's campus. They should be drawing fans. No, no, like... It's sold out every game. Like, I'm not like... It should be. They're on a no, but if you No, but if you look, right... That does not like even if you're on a college campus, does that mean you'll get close to sell out on a freaking Tuesday night? Well, you should when you literally can. Let's look at Arizona and then tell me the same thing. What? Look at Arizona and tell me the same thing. Arizona is selling out. (laughs) Arizona is selling out in that Arizona State Arena. The difference is the Hurricanes play in our in arena that is slightly smaller than the normal NBA arena. Like it's it's a small basketball sized arena. It can probably hold uh and you know let's look it up. What's the seating capacity for PNC Arena? Let's see what it brings back. What's the point of Siri when this is okay there's 18,000 seats. Yeah, selling right. that eighteen thousand on a Tuesday is something. <laughs> okay, but I, we're we're saying, well, you know, look at Arizona. They have three more than th- one third of the seats available, like less available. Yeah, like, we're talking about Arizona has five thousand for a seller. Yeah, yeah, they couldn't sell out when they were in Phoenix. Whatever. Like, we kind of knew that that was happening, and we, at this point, know that the deal's fallen through and the Coyotes are pretty much a lock to be somewhere else, which yep. we probably should have put in this episode, but didn't. Um, but that being said, like, the football practice facility is the bigger building in that parking lot. Like yeah. having guns, but I mean, to a game it's there. a like, it's a thing. Like the college students. The point should be is that, that out. okay, but hold on. the The point is whatever they're doing, as long as they maintain their ninety nine percent, they basically had a ninety nine percent attendance average the entire season. Yes, makes sense. No, like you look at other other teams in other areas like columbus you look at new jersey new jersey didn't even get close you look at even well that's newark like but even we're both from new jersey we know that newark isn't a place you go to at night even new york the islanders at least didn't like they carolina still beat them 
in attendance percentage. Okay, I mean, yeah, but you would think that the Islanders stadium being as new as it is should draw more than that. So, like not ninety nine percent much, but like the fact that they're basically on the LIRR or not LIRR, but they're on a train stop. Yeah. To walk to the arena, like there's no real excuse at that point. Um, so, but the point is that like that shows a lot. Like, regardless of like TV or whatever, right? They're still getting their fans to show up to basically every game. And yes, you can make the argument they're on a freaking college campus, but whatever. We have teams playing in oh. in ten thousand person arenas. Okay, like let's be honest. Okay, so let's take a look at the attendance before this year. So it was pretty high. Uh, well, they're on a two thousand seat upgrade this year in terms of attendance. Uh, before that, they crossed out twenty 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 one, obviously. Yeah. In twenty eighteen nineteen, they had fourteen thousand. Yeah. And so, then, but I mean, you can't say that whatever they're doing is drawing more fans. You you literally can't, like, whatever they're doing is working for them. Now, do I, I agree with you that they do have to make more changes, but... Well, it's not the storm surge that's driving them to... Like, when they had the storm surge year, that probably was the number one reason. People wanted to see what the, the show was going to be on the ice after. Yeah. But, but now it's like... Yeah, now it's a it's good hockey team. Okay, now let's also just fill in the cracks here and say they averaged in between 2014 through 2019, they still averaged, I mean, it's drastically different. It basically goes anywhere between 12,000 yeah, to, to 15,500. Makes sense. So... I mean, it's probably not the lowest in the NHL, but... So, but I mean, like... It's also not anywhere near what the Florida Panthers do in October. Right, but my point is that, like, yes, so for the, like, they're, they hit the Eastern Conference Finals again, right? Like, whatever. But at the same time, the hockey this hockey team is a business, right? So whatever they're doing not improving their team they are getting fans to show up in the seat with the team they currently have so what is next for them is a question in itself because like okay well how do they, they ideally want to keep the fans drawn and for us hockey fans it's improve your team and what's the what's the place that we know that they can improve their team it's james reimer right and it probably also is somewhat on I, I I hate to say Jordan Stahl's been good in Carolina for a long time in terms of being a leader, but he never has matched any of the point production that he ever was climbing towards in Pittsburgh. Yes. And for whatever reason, I'm not saying I'm rooting against him, but the fact that he's still on the Hurricanes at this point in his career probably indicates that there's a bit of you know what are we doing here um like that that probably and let's take a look at the lines because like i'm curious to where he actually fits okay so he's a third line set that's um, where i would put him probably okay and they do have paul stastny um they have Tivo Teravainen, and then I we're looking at. I mean, I don't know hockey as well as you do, but other than Sebastian Ajo this year because of Smetchnikov's injury, like you, you don't have a ton of goal scorers here. I'm not saying that a oh. team needs to have a Crosby, Gensel, Rust line, or yeah. like it, one of the boston top six lines to be successful but what i am saying is when i look at uh stefan notion sebastian ajo and seth jarvis line i don't really expect production outside of ajo when yeah. i look at uh t 
Teravine and Drury and Kakanyemi line. I don't expect a lot of production aside from Teravine and I mean, um, ideally, you should include that you should expect some production from Kakaniemi. Yes, but I do agree with you. He's kind of flopped in his career to an extent. Yes, um, no, no, but I'm saying it's like he is the player that you would hopefully expect the other more production to come from. I'm not saying he did or will. Mackenzie Macarin, uh, Jordan Stahl, and Martin Neckis on the line. Yeah, but... Just that the doesn't third spell line, man. Scoring at all. Okay, but third and you know. fourth lines, like I expect most of your scoring to be out of your first two lines, and okay, well, then in order to win a game, on the third line and just you know double down on the third line instead of the fourth line. Is Paul Stastny not good enough to score at this point in his career? No, but what I'm saying is most of your production. I, in the way that hockey works, most of your production is coming out of your top two lines. Now, the way you win games is by having your third or fourth line contribute a, a goal here or there. But is it Absolutely. saying that your scoring is coming from them? Uh, then unless your first two lines are overperforming, I think your line structure is ridiculously wrong. And look, I'll say this. Brent Burns probably played just as well as he has most of the year versus any other year in his career, despite the fact he's in his mid-late 30s. But their defensive pairings also include Jacob Slavin, Brady Shea, and Shane Gossett pair, which is pretty deep for defensive pairs. Yeah. Only you had the power in the offense like you do the power in the defense. But you got to say that... It's the game plan style. I just don't understand... I Why mean, I think shuffle? they played their style very well, and they were a more defensively oriented team, even on, like, their forwards. Okay, but how is it any different than what the Islanders did with Barry Trot? The Islanders, I'm pretty sure the island, like average age of somebody on the Islanders was, like, 35. Okay. And that's so a major difference. What we're saying, then, is it's... It's just as not acceptable because Carolina's guys are younger and should have the wheels to be able to do it. No, what I'm saying is you. I think defensive style play is fine, but I think that the Islanders I'm not talking failed. About the hmm? I'm not talking the defensive style. What I'm saying is if the Islanders and the Hurricanes play pretty much the same style, and the Islanders got to the conference finals before they lost under Barry Trotz at one point in the past five years. And Rob Brendamore decides, okay, we're going to play pretty much the same style. And they're going to get to the Eastern Conference finals before they lose. And then they're not going to get back. Then at what point, because but, Barry Trotz got fired from the Islanders, at what point do you have to make a change? But the, the point is that, like, I, I don't think... So, but you're still implying the style is wrong, and I don't no, think I'm implying that the style needs to be complemented more. You need to supplement your weaknesses, and what allowed the Islanders to make their run was not goal scoring. We'll admit that, but what it was is like as you said, start superb stardom goaltending doesn't mean shit either, but. You can't look at what happened with Robin Leonard and now with Sorokin yeah. and say that's the same. No, no, I agree. But like the the point is that like they can like if they got had better goaltending, not star goaltending, no no need for like uh Shesterkin or like a new carry price or whatever, right? Right. But yes, I agree. But I don't think you have to fix both of those things. Take your, like, like, it, it's hard enough to get those pieces. So do I think they should fix something? I really think they should focus on getting one of those pieces. But in the offseason, the NHL offseason is still a thing, right? Like, it's hard to get pieces you want because you're going to overpay. And especially in goaltending. Yeah, so, like so I do understand why it failed. We know, right? But fixing it isn't really that easy. 
So at this point, and I'm going to ask you genuinely, if you're the Hurricanes, what do you do? Do you double down further or do you look to make a change that's a little unconventional? Because knowing that the goaltender free agent market has produced kind of mixed bad because both these We supplement them instead of supplementing somewhere else. Um, I really think they should try and fix one of the areas, right? Get another offensive talent or get a goaltender. But it's hard, right? Like coming into the offseason, like as a Devils fan, we went into the offseason last year and we're like, let's do something, right? But it's it's very hard to get what you want and be okay paying that price. Right, especially through trading for goaltenders. It's it's a premium haul that Right. So, do I think they should do something like unorthodox? Ball. Not really because they risk too much in You don't know if their farm is deep enough. Correct. But at the same All time the like here. I do think that they should have the capital to make a move for a better goaltender or somebody to help on offense. It's going to be an overpay. The front office is not going to like it, but I do think they should do it. But dealing with both of those things, I don't think that's going to happen. It's weird because I think, like, looking back for them, when they made the trade with Florida to bring in, uh, I can't remember his name. He's with the Rangers now. Um, he was a winger, I admit, ironically, from Pittsburgh. Um, what's his name? Anyway, when they made the trade for that guy, I wonder how much of the assets they gave up that they would have rather had now because that okay. dude walked. I don't know. But I, I still think they have the capital to do it, right? It, that, that's the thing. All right. Anyway. On to, let's talk about the Bruins, right? Where are they? Well, this one's a little bit, um, a little bit harder to answer because of age is the factor on this one. Um, I, that team, I think is, it's going to look so different next year. I agree. I think that. I'd be more confident in saying that they should probably tear it down, which is a wild thing to say after they had the historic season that they did. Mm -hmm. And they do have Taylor Hall because they basically worked some, some magic to get him at the trade deadline a few years ago and then just locked him up. But David Krejci came back from Europe and... He has been productive, but I think at this point, that's probably out the window. Bergeron is gone. Sustainable. Uh, Marshawn yeah. is probably on his way out soon. Mm -hmm. So your young guys are going to have to step it up, right? You still have right. Pasta, McAvoy. Who was this guy on the Panthers? I swear I'm going to figure this out. The Panthers or the Rangers? Hurricanes. Vincent Trocheck, that's uh, who it was. Trocheck was on the when, Hurricane? Hurricane? Yeah. I thought he was traded from the Panthers to the Hurricanes. And that was a big deal at the time. Trocheck, oh, okay. Whatever. Yeah. And I wonder when he left. But anyway, getting back to Boston. Yes. Omar has was a bright spot, but let's let's take a look at what his contract is like because I'm willing to bet he doesn't have a long term deal. No, I don't think well, either of them are pretty no, long term. He has a deal. Um and he's covered for the next two years. Uh I guess the foresight of the Bruins signing him for a four year twenty million dollar deal before twenty twenty one twenty two it really paid off. Especially yeah, but that's a two years. Million to who they thought was going to be the backup. 
Yeah, but that that's a lot of money for a backup still. Correct, but they thought Swayman was going to be the number one this year, right? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, both of them played well, so I have no idea. Well, Swayman was filming all the commercials, so, <laughs> like, for national. Um, but I, I think it's asking a lot of Allmark to stay the same as what but, he had been. But also, like, what is Swayman's contracts looking like? Uh, let's see if I can find that out. Swayman is okay, he's on a three year deal, but as of when he's a free agent, it looks like. Yeah, so he's gonna he's get paid. ELO. He was on an ELO. ELC? Yep. Yeah, he's gonna get paid. ELC. So yeah, um which which depletes the roster that much more. Yeah. Um and so let's let's take a look at the roster in its entirety here. With um, Pasta on your way out, Krejci on your way yeah, out. He's a free agent. Charlie. Or, Cor- all right. So let's let's take a look at guys team. who, because they do have some young guys. Like the Swayman was twenty four. Frederick was twenty four. Uh, yeah, but who? Pavel Zaka is twenty five. McAvoy yeah, is twenty five. Pavel Zaka. We know what type of player Pavel Zaka really, is. McAvoy, or I'm sorry. Pasternak's only 26. Yeah, he's young. I thought that, that dude was like 31. No. That's crazy. All right. But anyway, uh, Tyler Bertuzzi's 27. Uh, I'm curious on his contract um, because that seems like a trade deadline deal. Right. But um, my point is that, like, okay, so you had all of the leadership in, like, Bergeron, Krejci, Marchand, right? Right, which they're 37, 36, and 34. Yeah, and so, but, like, now Nick that Polino Bergeron and Krejci are definitely on their way out, and Marshawn is probably on his way out soon, right. Um, where do you get that leadership from? It's up to Pasta and McAvoy to to really step it up. And where do you get the point production for from too? Because again, you're looking at the looking at two young guys I've mentioned: seven, fifty-eight, and fifty-six points. Yeah. You're looking at the two young guys I mentioned. You have to if you're a Bruins fan, right? Because on you're not getting that production out of Zaka. He he did okay, yeah, but again, he was on the points. check line. Yeah, so let's see who's locked up past this year. Zaka's locked. find that. Allmark is yeah. Pasta, I think. McAvoy, I think. So here's the interesting thing. Marchand is under contract for next year. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he's not he's not leaving this year, I don't think. Well, but you know who also is is Jake Debrusque is a free agent. Mm. Um they probably, if they're smart, are going to trade Charlie Coyle away at some point because he's on pretty major hit at almost five point three a year for the next three years. Okay, uh, he's kind of proven that he's not the player he once was. Um, no, but so the question I want to ask is: Okay, how do they fill the gap of at least Krejci and Bergeron? Right? Let's worry about getting a backup for Olmark because that's what it looks like you're going to try and do later. Actually, no. You have Swayman as an RFA, but still. You're probably, like, you're probably not going to give him the contract he wants, so it's probably going to go to arbitration and you're still going to pay him too much for a one-year deal or something. And what's the NHL salary cap? Because... 84? Yeah, eighty three point four million. I think next year so it'll go up by one million. Have, okay, so let's call it eighty four and a half million. So next year, and, and keep in mind on the NHL roster of this year, uh, and this may actually go into one or two AHL players. They have ten million in cap space, mm-hmm. or ten point five million in cap space. They have fourteen players under contract. Yep, that's going to be really hard to pull off. Yep. And yeah. They're looking at some yeah, AHLers to step up or getting some good deals, which is going to be and really that's hard. It's going to be just as hard because, yeah. you know, when you. But the, the point is that, like, deadline. you're losing a 
pretty two pretty big pieces, basically Krejci and Bergeron, right? Mm-hmm. Who's gonna step up in their place? And you're really hoping right now it's Pasta and uh, McAvoy. I don't see any. I don't see anybody else on the current roster who could potentially step it up to that level. Would you agree? I think that they take a major step back next year, um, whether they like it or not. Hmm? Or maybe not a major step back. I could still see them being top three in their division because it is Boston. Mm-hmm. Um, and they haven't really needed to rebuild very firmly in the past 20 years. Um, I do think that depending on how next year goes and whether Marshawn decides to retire or not, I think that's going to be a huge indicator. It's going to be a big indicator. And I think it's also going to come down to if Pasternak wants to stay around for a rebuild because he has a no trade clause, it looks like. But yeah, he's under contract through 2027 at $11.5 million a year. And if you're just going to tear it down at that point, you might as well just get what you can. Yep, exactly. All right. On to the MLB, as it is currently going on right now. We're about... Yeah. Lots going on with Oakland. We're about, what, like 25 games into the season for most teams? Oh, we're way above that. Are, are we? 50 games in. Oh, sh- Okay. Well, the Athletics going into today were 10 and 43. Oh, so right. They are no 10 and 40. Game. I'm not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it, it's a little bit of a mixed bag between current and future here because... From what I've learned, the owners of the Athletics had no real desire to ever keep the the team in Oakland. Yeah. And every time they proposed stadiums, and they kind of knowingly proposed stadiums with knowledge that as soon as there was a hiccup of, like, who was going to pay for it, they would just, like, withdraw. Mm -hmm. So all, all the renderings we've seen for great stadiums in Oakland over the past few years were probably all bullshit. No, they're all fake. Um, all fake. Right. It, it, it was just a hype train thing. Mm-hmm. But I think what we, we've we seen now, and I'm curious what we're going to see with the Arizona Coyotes because of what this kind of means in the same landscape at the same time, is that Oakland to Vegas has obviously worked for the Raiders, although uh, Vegas was really kind of more ready to roll out the red carpet for the NFL. Mm -hmm. Um, And now it's kind of like, well, Vegas will take the MLB team if you want to give it up, but like they don't really need it. Like, right, but I do think amount of success with the Knights. Yeah. They also have it's their the two, uh, the Chargers are moving there too, right? No. Oh, I don't remember. Chargers moved. No, they to moved to LA. LA. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, sorry. A little bit in the past there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, but yeah, so they had success with the Golden Knights. They have success with the Raiders. I do think Oakland also has the problem of being in, like, San Francisco and L.A. are all, like... It's in the shadow. Right there, right? There's four teams right there, including them. Right. Let's, plus, let's also say what it is in regards to Oakland. For being right next to another major city in San Francisco, the reputation that Oakland is the dumpier option of yeah, between just, San Francisco just like the and Raiders. Oakland. Right. So, like... I think it's fair to say that right now San Francisco has that locked down to an extent to where it's like, you know, if I'm a football fan and I really am going to value the the organization, the location, stuff like that, and I live in the Bay Area, Right. Why wouldn't I just be a 49ers fan? Because they have a stadium that opened up less than 10 years ago. They have great history, just like the Raiders. Uh, you know, right. The Golden State Warriors left o- Oakland and went to San Francisco. Yeah. So, like, the athletics are all that are there now. And they've shown that in this 
ever-growing uh, sports world of constant renovations for their facilities that they have no interest in doing that. Mm -hmm. There's possums in the visiting uh, telecast booths to the point where the Mets actually, their broadcasters walked in and smelled possum shit and were told by the athletics like organization, like, just take another, because, like, this possum lives here and you, you just can't be in this one. Like, that's what hospitality is to the athletics right now is, like, the possum gets this booth. Right. And anyway, so yeah, they released a rendering for a ballpark in Las Vegas, which would cost like almost one and a half billion dollars. Um, do I really think they need a one and a half billion dollar stadium? No. Do I think they're going to ever get to even three thirty thousand people past the first season in a seat? Probably not. Um, but anyway, yeah, they had the lowest. They have the lowest attendance so far. Um. By a whopping three thousand, almost four. So like three and a yeah. half. Um, That's a pretty bad margin to be in. Eight point nine thousand people per game. Yeah, I mean it's not good when you can't top ten. Yeah, it's also like you're right there with Miami and then Kansas City. Miami, we understand they're basically just like whatever. Kansas City, even that's Miami a is double. like, you know, if I'm going to be out in the sun, there's a million other places to be in Miami. Yeah, exactly. Kansas I, City's rebuilding and like... Yeah, but like, the Kansas City can still draw double the amount. Right, and Kansas City is kind of a small stadium. <laughs> yeah. So, I, again, and even Pittsburgh is at like 17. But Pittsburgh, like, your fan base is you pretty draw loyal. Other fans, too. Like, I, I went to the game against the Blue Jays, and I did not know that Toronto was, like, a five-hour drive mm -hmm. from Pittsburgh. So, like, you know, we draw other fans. When the Mets come into town, we're going to have tons of Mets fans. Yeah. Like, everybody wants to... to I made that road trip. Taking the view. Yeah, and you have. Mm -hmm. Remember the Brewers game. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I even made that road trip, like, quite a long time ago when we were... Before it was with me being yeah. here. Um... But I think what's interesting, like, yeah, we have the stat that says the same night that they had 3,000 fans at an Oakland game, there were 11 of 13 AAA minor league games that had surpassed yeah. attendance. Which but I mean, like, basically have less than 10,000 capacity. I mean, we can fill, like, in New Jersey, we can fill a Somerset's Patriots games without, without trying to more fans than... And that, and that stadium is basically in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Like, the, the, the biggest attraction next to it is, a, is like, a Bed Bath & Beyond. It's a Chuck E. Cheese, um, like, 10 minutes down the road. But they do have the Costco. They do have the Costco. Yeah. And that, that now is a big thing. Yeah. Um, uh, how quickly that changed. But um, getting back to it, I, I think it's obvious that the athletics owners of an ownership group are making moves to say the money is not ever going to be here so why would we try for it to be here and i right. think but regardless I of what money there is in vegas because like when i looked at the renderings and i see the renderings are this ballpark is Literally in the shadow of the MGM Grand, like a block away. Yeah. The first thing I that comes to my head is the MGM Grand can't possibly have that much real estate next to it. Like, there's no way that this stadium is going to finalize itself in the way that the renderings do. Probably. Like, I, did, I, they, there's no way the that they arena. will. Okay. M my uh, counter to this is I just ignore the rendering until I see a better budgeted stadium because i don't think like the owners don't want to pay 1.5 billion dollars the city definitely don't want to pay 1.5 billion dollars right but if we're talking about the hypothetical that will they sell 30 you know 20 thousand seats uh, if they're on the vegas strip i don't see them not yeah, yeah, because, yeah like the vegas strip is just that good of a location and but then like it devolves vegas, from a baseball game to, to a show else. I'm sorry? But if they go anywhere close to the the Vegas trip, they are no longer playing baseball. They're having a show on a baseball field. Right, but because of how big gambling is in Vegas, 
it is the it Dude. becomes a, a great alternative. Yeah, fair. I, I mean, I agree, but I still don't you think that this is realistic. You at the blackjack table, and you say, you know, what? I'm just going to take in an athletics game. Like, that's a fair way to get yourself to stop gambling for three hours. Yeah, but then you're probably gambling on the athletics game because they're probably going to lose anyway. No, so you're not. Have you seen how bad they are? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Anyway, um, like, again, growing up, I was really big into the athletics, so it's kind, of, it's kind of sad to see them, like, trying to move. But, you know, I understand. I think that for them, it's probably overdue. They're, yeah, definitely. Like, I say the possum thing, but, like, it's been well known, the sewage stuff, it's been well known that they're not really renovating or upgrading anything in that ballpark. And it's been that way for, like, 10 yeah. years now. So, in some ways, if they weren't going to do anything about it, they've probably overstayed their welcome. Yeah, definitely. So, no, I, like, again, I, it totally makes sense. It's just like, you know, I, I've been, like, I used to go to a lot of Oakland games as a kid. Probably, so. Right, it's a little sad. It wouldn't be like if the Buffalo Bills, like, left Buffalo and the fan base was huge and it, like, ripped them yeah. apart. No, this uh, fan base is pretty different. small, so... It's a little small, and it's probably easier to just be like, you know what? San Francisco was there the whole time. Yep. Plus, at this point, they're so bad that, like, I'm sure young fans would just rather be Giants fans anyway. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, th- hey, you got anything to round out the episode with? Or we good? No. No, I, I think I'm okay. Um, You know... We probably could have touched on the Coyotes thing uh, with them not getting approved again. Nah. Uh, I think it, it sounds like they're all but gone from Arizona. Yeah, we'll see. But yeah, we can touch on that in the off-season talk. So sounds good. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.